All right. Last week, we left off at this verse and this slide. So I'm just trying to bring back to your memory what we were discussing at that point. Verse 19 said, he shall turn back. And this is referring to Antiochus III, sometimes called Antiochus the Great. He shall turn back toward the fortresses of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So quick refresher, Antiochus III gave his daughter, Cleopatra, remember that, to Ptolemy V. They were both teenagers. Cleopatra was 17. Ptolemy was probably 14. Antiochus was hoping that his very bright, astute daughter would sort of mold her younger husband in the direction of her father, Antiochus, and make Egypt kind of a puppet kingdom to Antiochus himself. He underestimated his daughter. She was politically astute and realized that the smart money was betting on Rome. And so even though she'd gone with instructions from her father, she went a different direction and indeed began to court through her husband reliance with and dependence on Rome. And that became critically important within the next few years. Well, when Antiochus realized that his daughter had, in a sense, double-crossed him, he didn't want to attack her directly, so he thought he'll just go chase off the Romans. And so he went off to Greece to fight wars there and found out he was up against a tiger he couldn't control. And in 188, finally, he was defeated and a piece of Apamea, as it's called, was transacted between Rome and Antiochus, which imposed harsh terms of reparation for war debts on Antiochus. That forced him to go back, pillaging, rummaging through his empire, looking for money to pay off the Romans. And while he was doing so, he was stabbed in the back while in a temple trying to rob its treasuries in Susa. So that's where we left off. Then verse 20, which we read this morning, Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an official for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, though not in anger or in battle. The successor to Antiochus is a guy named Seleucus IV Philopater, meaning lover of his father. He takes over in Syria. At the same time, we also have a new king in Egypt. This is a few years later now. Ptolemy VI Philometer, lover of his mother, and so there they are, you know, great family guys. And so he takes over in Egypt. Seleucus IV had the same problem as his father Antiochus. He had huge war debts to pay to the Romans. So he did the same thing. He wanted to loot the treasuries of various temples in the ancient world. And one of the most, at least famously wealthy, whether it really was or not, remained a different question, but he thought it was, was the temple in Jerusalem. He sent one of his commanders, a man by the name of Heliodorus, to raid and rob the temple in Jerusalem. This is a famous painting by the Renaissance artist Raphael called The Expulsion of Heliodorus from the Temple. It was a famous incident in Jewish history. What happened was that Heliodorus showed up with a cadre of military force behind him and tried to approach the temple, and there was this ferocious reaction of the priests and the popular uh, level as well, keeping him out. And they were so effective that, in fact, Heliodorus backed off and decided to go home, and he went back and told his king, Seleucus IV, that angels had stopped him. Supernatural powers had come and prevented him from entering the temple. I don't know if Seleucus was convinced by that, but as it turns out, Heliodorus assassinated Seleucus sometime later, and that was the end of him. So that brief uh, period of time is really separating now Antiochus from the fellow we're really interested in. The uh, two political parties that were emerging at this time in Jerusalem were called the Tobiads and the Oniads. They are the liberals and the conservatives. I mentioned last week that you have this rising division of opinion in Jerusalem. Some people are inclined favorably toward the Syrians and toward Hellenism generally. This was regarded as up to date. This is really sophisticated culture. If a person is really with it, they're going to be Greek. They're going to dress Greek, speak Greek, act Greek. You see, that was sort of the way you 
distinguished yourself as someone that was somewhat, uh, you know, upper crust, that kind of thing. And the Oniads, on the other hand, who took their name from Onias III, who was the high priest in Jerusalem at the time and a direct descendant of Aaron, were more traditional, more conservative. They wanted nothing to do with this Hellenistic flavor. They wanted to remain true to the biblical tradition that came down all the way from Moses. So you have a division in the house here in Jerusalem in these days, and they go by those two names. They'll pop up a little later as we go along. Verse 21, In his place shall arise a contemptible person on whom royal majesty had not been conferred. This is Antiochus IV. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom through intrigue. Antiochus IV Epiphanes then shows up in Syria, and this is in 175 on the death of Seleucus IV. He took control of Syria, claiming to rule on behalf of his brother Demetrius. That's why it says he came in with intrigue. His brother Demetrius was actually a prisoner in Rome. Antiochus came in saying, oh, I'm, I'm just doing this on behalf of my brother. Soon, hopefully, he'll be released and then he can take over. I'm just here as a caretaker. Of course, Antiochus had other designs, but that's how he insinuated himself into this leadership position. He became the most hated of all the foreign rulers that ever had dominion in Jerusalem during this era and remains to this day one of the most contemptible people in Jewish recollection. Armies shall be utterly swept away and broken before him and the prince of the covenant as well. This is kind of a broad descriptive language to describe his overall reign. It's not a particular detail, but more kind of a theme that ran throughout. The reference to the prince of the covenant is probably a reference to the fact that he was in some ways responsible for the death of this priest I mentioned earlier, Onias III because Onias really rose up against him, and so that's probably the Prince of the Covenant who is referred to there. But otherwise, this is a pretty good description of the overall tenor of his reign. After an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully and shall become strong with a small party. He insinuated himself, as I said, into rule in Syria, and once he had consolidated his position and had some very loyal people, a fairly small group, committed to him, then he pulled the mask off and said, oh, just kidding, I'm really going to be the ruler here. And at that point, he repudiated any connections to his poor brother back in Rome, Demetrius, and declared himself to be the ruler of Syria. He was able to gain control with that relatively small military force, and that's very reflective of what's stated then in that verse. Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province and do what none of his predecessors had ever done, lavishing plunder, spoil, and wealth on them. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. Antiochus is the first guy who's actually in a position to use a little of the wealth of his position. The others had been having to pay off Roman debt, and that was more or less under control by this point. So Antiochus comes in and really buys the loyalty of a great deal of the nobility in Syria. And that's precisely what the verse seems to imply. So he's able to buy well-placed bribes and other uses of his funds, get a certain degree of stability and loyalty among these people who would be necessary to support him. A particular detail here that falls under this rubric is connected, however, with what's happening in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, he was planning to eventually launch an attack against Egypt and its King Ptolemy. And more or less, I think, with designs having that in mind, he received a character from Jerusalem whose name was Jason. Now, Jason was a Jewish man, and his Jewish name was Joshua. But he didn't want to be Jewish. That wasn't sophisticated. If you're going to be cool, you need to have a cool Greek name. So he changed his name to Jason. So Jason now is a fairly prominent character in Jerusalem, but he also happens to be the brother of Onias III, the high priest. So there's a division in the family of the priest. Onias is a true, committed, traditional Jewish priest, loyal to Moses, loyal to the heritage of God's people that had been received down through the ages. 
Jason, on the other hand, wants to be an up-to-date Greek Hellenistic kind of guy. So apparently they didn't get along very well. And Jason thought to himself, you know, I bet Antiochus would be open to a proposition. And so Jason goes and visits Antiochus and says, hey, look, that brother of mine, Onias, is a stick in the mud. He's just old fashioned. What you want is for Jerusalem to be a Hellenistic showcase. And I'm the guy to do it. And furthermore, you need Jerusalem to be paying you a whole lot more revenue than it is, and I can do that for you too. So my proposition is, depose my brother Onias and make me, Jason, the high priest in Jerusalem. Now the most authoritative position in Jerusalem at the time was the high priest. They didn't have a king or other political power, and so the high priest really got pretty much what he wanted, and was highly respected in town. And so Jason is wanting to take over that role. And the promise he's making is that he'll make a good you know, show for Antiochus by so doing. Antiochus digs that action. So he says, fine, man, you're in. And he deposes Onias and Jason is appointed the high priest in Jerusalem in 174. What Jason did was, true to his word, transform Jerusalem into a kind of Hellenistic city. This is a typical shot. It's not the one in Jerusalem. It was eventually destroyed, but very typical of the so-called Greek gymnasium or the gymnasium, as it was called. He built one of these structures within a stone's throw of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, that was bad enough, but the Hellenistic practice, as you may know, when the athletic competition took place, was to engage in this athletic activity in gumnos, hence the term gumnosium. Anybody know what the Greek word gumnos means? Naked. And so you've got not just athletic events, you've got a pagan expression of the most really kind of blatant form within a stone's throw of the holy precincts of worship. And you can imagine how the city just, even the, even the liberals, that was a little over the top for them. And this was what Jason did. So he certainly did make good on his promises to Antiochus, but he provoked quite a crisis then within Jerusalem because of doing that. Well, three years later, another guy, this would be someone like a city councilman. He's not a priestly family. He has no connections to the priesthood whatsoever. He's also a Jewish man. He's also taken a Greek name, Menelaus, who was a famous, of course, king. You may know of Sparta back at the time of the Trojan War. So he takes this name, Menelaus, and he thinks, wow, if Antiochus would depose the true high priest and install his brother, who really isn't the legitimate high priest, then what's to say he wouldn't depose the whole priestly family and put me in there as that priestly character? And so Menelaus goes to Antiochus and says, hey, I can outdo Jason. I'll make Jerusalem even more Hellenistic and I'll make sure you get even more money. You see, this, by the way, is the moment when the priesthood in Jerusalem ceased to be legitimate. The priests who were serving in Jerusalem at the time of Christ were not descendants of Aaron. That stopped at this moment. And there's a sense in which the legitimacy of the priesthood itself ceased at this point because the Hebrew law said that the priest was to be a descendant of Aaron. And this is the moment it ended. Menelaus goes, has a little conversation with Antiochus. Antiochus says, sounds good to me. And he throws aside Jason and puts in Menelaus as the high priest. Well, Onias was so outraged by this. I mean, he was willing to kind of be quiet when his brother Jason was the high priest. At least it was still the priestly family. But when Onias saw that a complete outsider, a complete stranger to the priestly office was now exercising that authority, Onias had had it. And in a very public way, he stood up and condemned Menelaus, at which time Menelaus, of course, ordered on the authority of Antiochus his execution. And that's why it said earlier in the text, presumably the prince of the covenant, was swept aside as well. Well, at this point, the Oniads in Jerusalem, these people who were true traditionalists, 
who had been loyal to Onias on the death of their hero, they appealed to the Egyptians. Please remember last week we were saying that Jerusalem was fairly happy to get out from under the Egyptian thumb years earlier when Antiochus III had taken over Jerusalem. They didn't like the Egyptians. Now the tables are turned. Now Egypt didn't look so bad. And so they send an email down to uh, uh, Ptolemy VI appealing to him to come and help them out in the face of this just almost blasphemous abuse of Jewish law that was taking place with respect to Menelaus. This brings us to verse 25. He shall stir up his power and determination, referring to Antiochus IV, against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with a much greater and stronger army, but he shall not succeed. For plots shall be devised against him by those who eat the royal rations. All right, so what happens here is that Ptolemy, the Egyptian ruler now, appreciates the appeal that he's received from Jerusalem, but he's not quite ready to just pick a fight. So he st decides instead to do just sort of a, a modest little incursion into what's called Kole Syria. It's the southern part of Syria. It actually includes the region of Jerusalem. So he sends a small military force up to establish what amounts to a staging area from which he hopes later to launch a more robust military campaign. It's not supposed to provoke a lot of attention or get a lot of response, but in fact it provokes a spectacular military response from Antiochus. This little incursion into his territory brings a pretty ferocious response from Antiochus with the military army that uh, comes, as is suggested here in this verse. Ptolemy actually had a larger force, but what turns out is that Ptolemy himself was betrayed into Syrian hands by some of his closest advisors. And so when you read in this verse here, plot shall be devised against him by those who eat the royal rations, that's what it's saying. That some of Ptolemy's closest associates actually betrayed him into the hands of Antiochus, and that made this whole thing take a different shape. They shall break him, his army shall be swept away, and many shall fall slain. So speaking of Ptolemy now, his army surrendered because Ptolemy himself had been captured, and Ptolemy was reduced to a kind of puppet under the control of Antiochus. This is all happening in the year 170. The only place that held out was the city of Alexandria, which was the most powerful city in Egypt. The great cities that we know of from the past, Thebes down in the south, or Memphis kind of in the middle of Egypt, had both ceased to be really centers of great power and Alexandria was the place where all of the action was going on and where the great military expression was present. And these people in Alexandria were not so sure they were prepared to accept this new regime in which Ptolemy was reduced to a puppet. And so what they did, actually, was they appointed Ptolemy's brother, a younger brother, who comes to be known as Ptolemy VIII. His nickname was Fiscon. That's a picture of him there, the lower. Fiscon means, literally in Greek, fat belly. <laughs> he didn't seem to mind it. He was a corpulent individual. So you've got two Ptolemies now ruling in Egypt. Ptolemy VI, the true ruler, but he's been captured now by Antiochus. Fiscon, ruling in Alexandria. You may be wondering what happened to Ptolemy VII. He is the son of Ptolemy VI, but he's only an infant, so he doesn't have much play at this point. So these two guys are both making claims to be rulers of Egypt. All right. Now, verse 27, the two kings, their minds bent on evil. Now, the two kings here are Antiochus and Ptolemy VI, shall sit at one table and exchange lies. But it shall not succeed, for there remains an end at the time appointed. So these two kings get together and act as if they are going to form common cause to get rid of Fiscon. But of course, in the back of each of their minds are designs to get rid of each other at the same time. So it's a very typically political, hypocritical 
lying conversation among typical politicians. You know how that goes. So anyway, this is what's happening. The two negotiated hypocritically to destroy Ptolemy VIII. Of course, to do this, Antiochus realized that he needed more firepower. And so he went home at this point, leaving his puppet, Ptolemy VI, to rule what remained of Egypt, excepting Alexandria. And he's going to go and regroup. He's going to fire up a bigger military engine and then come back to take over or to, to uh, execute his plans. And so it's in this context we have verse 28. He shall return to his land with great wealth, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant. He shall work his will and return to his own land. So Antiochus is stopping by Jerusalem on his, on his way from Egypt back to Syria. He stops there. He has his ally, Menelaus, help him levy a special tax on all of Jerusalem. He wants to fundraise and he's going to gather money from wherever he can. And so he grabs as much money as he can from Jerusalem at this point. Then he heads back to Syria to engage in further fundraising so he can come back with his military force. While he's away, Fiscon is able to stage a complete coup and drive out Ptolemy VI. Because at this point, Ptolemy VI has been greatly weakened and... Fiscon is, of course, the guy the Egyptians in Alexandria are rallying to. What happens is that Ptolemy VI, the son of Ptolemy V, flees from Egypt and goes to Rome. Remember, there had already been a relationship with the Romans courted by his father Ptolemy V and Cleopatra. And so he's a known quantity. He shows up in Rome and says, hey, you've got to help me. Egypt, Egypt is sw uh, spinning out of control. Reinstate me to my proper role there. And so that's what's happening but behind the scenes as these things are going on. Verse 29, at the time appointed, he shall return, Antiochus returns, comes to the south, but at this time it shall not be as before. Well, this challenge launched by Fiscon against Ptolemy, the puppet of Antiochus, brings Antiochus back with this much larger military force, and the year is now 168. And he shows up, but as it says here, it won't be this time as it was before. This time, when he arrives in Egypt, he finds he's not simply dealing with Egyptian powers, he's got Rome there, because the Romans have responded favorably to the appeal given to them by Ptolemy VI. Now, it's not a huge Roman army that shows up. It's a fairly small but very disciplined Roman legion that's there. And it's led by a Roman senator who's not a military man. He's dressed in a loose-fitting Roman toga. You know how they would appear. And he's standing there, and his name is, uh, well, we'll get to his name in a minute. For ships from Kitim shall come against him, that is Antiochus, and he shall lose heart and withdraw. He shall be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay heed to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. All right. The Roman guy that's there is G. Popilius Linnaeus. It's one of the most famous incidents in ancient history in which Popilius drew a line in the sand from whence we get this expression. Now, what happened was Antiochus is there. He's got this good-sized Syrian army behind him, very impressive. And he, of course, is in his full military garb, looking very powerful. And then you've got this Roman guy, probably a little kind of, you know, what, plump, uh, a Roman senator, not a military man, holding a little rod and a few Roman soldiers behind him. So it really seems like a pretty disproportionate power would favor Syria. But, of course, Antiochus knows that behind this Roman senator is the power of Rome itself, and that gets his attention. Well, Popelius says to Antiochus, okay, we have a treaty agreement with Egypt based on arrangements made by Ptolemy V, and so you need to understand if you attack Egypt, that is going to provoke a treaty violation that requires Roman response, and so you're going to be fighting not just Egypt, you're going to be fighting Rome. So what's it going to be? Are you going to go home, or are you going to proceed with this military expedition and tangle with Rome? 
Antiochus, a very proud man, is wondering what to do. He says, I need a little time to think about this. Let me go consult with my counselors. I'll get back to you in a day or two. Popelius doesn't say a word, but he takes that little wand in his hand and starts drawing a circle in the sand, and he draws a complete circle all the way around Antiochus. Then he says, let me make myself clear. If you step out of this circle without giving me a response, that will be deemed a declaration of war by you on Rome. What are you going to do? Now, Sigmund Freud had an expression called displacement. Displacement is where something bad happens at work, but instead of retaliating at work, you go home and kick the cat. You know? You ever heard of that? Maybe you've been there. And that's what happened with Antiochus. He was completely humiliated. He had his whole army behind him, and yet he didn't have the guts to stand up to Rome because he knew what Rome could do. And so, angry and humiliated, he skulked away, saying, okay, okay, you're going to have your Egypt. And that was the end of that. But now here he is with all of these forces, all dressed up, nowhere to go. And so, of course, Jerusalem is the major city between him and home. And he took out his anger and humiliation on Jerusalem. As the verse says here, he shall turn and pay, uh, turn back and pay heed to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. There were some in Jerusalem who were willing to, by this time, forsake their own religion and support the, as, the, you know, loosely using the term, the reforms that were going to be put in place by Antiochus, and so that's what takes place. This becomes this moment of great abuse. In Jerusalem, he does several things. For one thing, he tore down a bunch of houses in Jerusalem to build a defensive fortress to prevent the Romans from making any further incursions into his own territory. But he does a few other things that are really calculated to simply insult the Jewish psyche and especially the Jewish religion. He changed the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, to Zeus Olympus. That's who we now are going to worship. He ordered the Jews to begin sacrificing pigs to Zeus. And if you know anything about Jewish religion, you know how abhorrent that would be. He prohibited the celebration of Sabbath days, festivals, or the rite of circumcision. He committed what's sometimes called the abomination of desolation, mentioned by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, in which he went to the temple and took a pig and slew it on the brazen altar right there in the holy precincts in front of the temple. He plundered the temple treasury, and he left troops, as he left town, he left a bunch of troops behind him to carry out what amounted to a reign of terror over the next three years or so there in Jerusalem. Forces sent by him shall occupy and profane the temple and fortresses. They shall abolish the regular burnt offering and set up the abomination that makes desolate. So this incident in particular was the one that was probably the most outrageous from the Jewish point of view in which he commits this abomination of desolation, sacrificing a pig. Well, the temple was taken over, of course, by the Syrians and was shut down. So as we were saying a couple of weeks ago, the temple ran in an uninterrupted way from the time it was put back in operation under Darius until it was destroyed by the Romans, with one exception, three years and these are the three years, 168 to 165, in which it had been desecrated and, of course, controlled now by the Syrians. And so for this three-year period of time, this, the temple is basically not operating. He shall seduce with intrigue those who violate the covenant, but the people who are loyal to their God shall stand firm and take action. There were two groups in Jerusalem, as you know. One group was called the Jewish Hellenists. These were the proto-Sadducees. That term doesn't seem to be used yet, but it was the group that eventually became the Sadducees that we hear about in the New Testament. They basically embraced the pagan worship at this point. They were willing to not put up a fuss and simply allow the terms of new life in Jerusalem to be implemented as uh, indicated. The other group were called the Hasidim, the pious ones. These are the proto-Pharisees. And they are the ones who really, in this case, heroically opposed the Syrian presence, oftentimes at risk of life and limb.
The wise among the people shall give understanding to many for some days, however, but they shall fall by sword and flame and suffer captivity and plunder. We hear the details of this from the book of Maccabees, and it's given in excruciating detail what happened. There were, this was like an underground resistance, sort of like the Nazi occupation of France during the Second World War. You know, there was a whole underground movement among the French to resist the Nazis. This is very much the same kind of thing. The Syrians were there, and there was a pretty ferocious underground uh, campaign to push them off, but it was not successful, at least at the beginning. Many of these people were competent scholars of the Jewish faith. They had sort of underground worship services and teaching and so on going on. In spite of all of that, tens of thousands were martyred, some of them under horrific circumstances. There are great, wonderful stories of heroic martyrdoms that took place during this time, clearly reflecting a deep, heartfelt faith among many of these Jewish people who wanted to hang on to their faith in the face of this kind of oppressive presence. And so it's wonderful reading and very much worth uh, taking a look at it if you have opportunity. When they fall victim, they shall receive a little help and shall join them, uh, who sh many shall join them insincerely. I think the best guess is that when it refers to this little help, it's referring to the Maccabean revolt. The reason it's called a little help is because even though the Maccabean revolt started with a pretty deep commitment to authentic, legitimate Jewish tradition, it went sideways pretty soon thereafter. And so it became highly watered down. And by the time all the dust had settled, this Maccabean revolt had really more or less become a kind of almost a connection between the Jewish people and this Hellenistic culture in the form of the Hasmonean dynasty that came sometime later. So I think the term a little help used in the biblical text here is probably appropriate. There were early successes by the Maccabees, and this led many to join them, but they weren't joining out of sincere devotion to the Jewish faith or culture, but rather simply because they were trying to be on the winning bandwagon, and so it was that kind of insincere participation. Some of the wise shall fall so that they may be refined, purified, and cleansed until the time of the end, for there is still an interval until the time appointed. The time appointed is the time of Messiah, we're still around 160 years out from the birth of Messiah. This did have a huge purifying effect on God's people, which is why when Jesus finally did reach the scene, there was a deep, legitimate, heartfelt population of people looking for God's Messiah. And we see evidence of that again and again in the New Testament. It seems that this is what was being achieved. All right, let me just give you a quick sketch here in my limited time of what actually happened in the Maccabean Revolt. We have Antiochus IV, who I just mentioned he uh, is ruling here from 175 to 164. This campaign against the Jewish people is in 168. In 167, this group of Syrian troops that he left behind to implement this Hellenistic kind of campaign we're going around Jerusalem. Jerusalem was under their control, but now they're trying to pick off one by one the little communities that surround Jerusalem. One of those towns is called Modien, which is about 20 miles from Jerusalem. So these Syrian troops come, and as they commonly did, demanded that the folks engage in public pagan worship, act in treason, really, against their own Jewish religion. The priest in that town was a man by the name of Mattathias. He was about 80 years old. But he was so outraged that in, I think, it must have just been a supernatural fit of adrenaline. When these Syrian soldiers were there making this demand, he actually manhandled one of them, grabbed his sword, and slew about eight of these Syrian soldiers and two or three of the Jewish people who were about to go ahead and, and do this thing. I mean, he just went crazy, you know, and so kind of mayhem broke out, and these Syrian soldiers had, you know, they, they either were killed or had to run for cover, and that was the beginning of the Maccabean Revolt, this guy named Mattathias. From that point, he called all the people who wanted to be faithful to the covenant to follow him, and they all went out into the Judean wilderness and began to launch a kind of guerrilla-type campaign against the Syrians who were there uh, in operation in that region. Well, Mattathias, as I said, was an elderly fellow, and he died two years later, actually one year later, 166. His middle son, he had five sons, the third of them was a man named Judas. Judas. 
and he came to be called Judas Maccabeus. The family name was Hasmonean, but Maccabeus was the Syrian word for hammer, because that's the way they viewed him. So Judas continued this campaign, and be, over the next year or so had a series of stunning victories. He was greatly outnumbered by the Syrian forces, but he was such a brilliant tactician that he was able to nevertheless score these victories and really create quite a problem for the Syrians who were trying to occupy this region. Finally, in 165, Judas was able to retake Jerusalem and rededicate the temple. 165, so three years to the day after the temple had been desecrated by Antiochus, it's rededicated and cleansed with the, uh, with the care of uh, Judas. And so that takes place. And this, of course, is what Daniel is talking about in the verses we just looked at, verses 34 and 35 of Daniel chapter 11. The Jewish celebration of Hanukkah is celebrating the oil that burned for eight days. When they rededicated the temple, they needed consecrated oil. And they didn't have any, or not very much. And so in faith, they went ahead and lit these, uh, the, the lampstand there in the temple. And then as the story goes, and I'm not willing to deny it, miraculously, the lamp kept burning for eight days, even though there was clearly not enough oil to keep it going. Thus, it came to be called the Feast of Lights, or the Feast of of dedication that's referred to in the Gospel of John 10:22. So happy Hanukkah. That's what is being celebrated when our uh, Jewish friends celebrate their, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of festivities there at uh, Christmas time. Uh, that's the reason why. All right. Well, civil war broke out in Syria because Antiochus IV, the bad guy we've been talking about, dies in a minor skirmish. And there's a conflict over who's going to control Syria. And that, of course, gives Judas an opportunity with all of that, you know, confusion up there to the north to really gather power and momentum in Israel. He makes enemies, however, because he was, ex he was a conservative in the extreme. This would be sort of like, if you know the term Sharia law, on steroids. It was that kind of thing, you know. He was just vicious in imposing the most strict form of Jewish law so that he actually provoked a lot of negative sentiment even among his own people. He was a great military character. He wasn't so good at politics and not, was not very good at diplomacy at all. And so this is, uh, you know, this is basically what's going on. In 162, that brother who had been in prison in Rome is uh, released. He shows up and he is able to, uh, through this uh, civil war conflict, uh, get himself into a position of leadership. The liberal Jews in Jerusalem actually appeal to Demetrius to help them from uh, against Judas, oddly enough, you know. So that's kind of the direction this thing went. Judas was killed in a battle, the Battle of Elasa in 161. I'm going to go through the rest of this very rapidly because I want to uh, wrap this up, but just kind of the quick sketch that gets us to the end of this uh, little section here. His brother Jonathan was a much more bright tactician politically. And so what he does is, in a more quiet and kind of uh, slow and steady way, gather strength by quiet diplomacy in Jerusalem, nevertheless not putting up a direct uh, front against Demetrius, who had come in now and gotten rid of Judas. Uh, Jonathan is certainly an important character, but he does what he does a little bit more quietly and uh, diplomatically. Demetrius himself died in 150. That gave rise to a conflict between two characters. This guy, Alexander Balas, was a usurper. He was killed, and it brought Demetrius II to the throne. Jonathan himself was a brilliant and adroit, courting both sides in the conflict. And the long and short of it is that he was eventually appointed governor in Jerusalem. That might be good, but he also managed to have himself appointed high priest. That was not good. He was, he was not, he was a broadly of the priestly family, but he wasn't a legitimate priest at all. And besides that, in Jewish law, you don't combine church and state in the same office. And so this was kind of holding himself out in a sense as a messianic character. And that is kind of a death knell here, and, and that uh, did create a cloud really over his head.
Uh, his brother Simon was appointed governor in Philistine territory. Jonathan died in 142. Simon, the brother, was able to negotiate at that point Jewish independence. They'd become enough of a problem that actually in this turn of events and the political turmoil, he was able to actually establish Jewish independence and thus was established what's called the Hasmonean dynasty, which was the Jewish nobility at the time of the birth of Christ. Herod the Great was married to a Hasmonean princess, and that's how he tried to legitimate his own status there among the Jewish people. So that is kind of the state of affairs in uh, uh, Israel, and we're going to leave it at that for about the next three months. <laughs> and uh, in the fall, we're going to come back and then try to rebuild this story from the Roman point of view. We'll cover some of this again. In my very rapid uh, uh, Sunday school lesson this morning, I'd like to have you turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 22. This is Jesus. Now, and we read the following. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. That's Hanukkah. This is, of course, winter time. Jesus is there. This is probably prior to the Passover, where Jesus himself, of course, would be killed. I'm sorry, did I not say verse 22? John 10, 22. He was at the festival of the dedication. Now, we need to understand that this was probably the time more than any other time of the year when the Jewish people were thinking of Messiahs because the famous history of Judas Maccabeus was part of their culture. And so this was the time when they started thinking and looking and asking about a coming Messiah, thinking it would be another Judas, another political character who could you know, brilliantly drive off, in this case, the Romans. So, not surprisingly, we find what happens next. Verse 23, Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon, a very prominent area there in the temple. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Because Jesus has on the one hand, appeared to be a Messiah, and yet on the other hand, has not looked very much like Judas Maccabeus. We don't see much military strategy going on. We don't see him making a kind of military machine and otherwise engaging in the sorts of activities that you would expect of a Messiah. And during this richly messianic time of the year, that, of course, became the central concern of the folks who were talking to Jesus. If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered and said, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. I think what Jesus is saying here is, I have told you that I am the Messiah. But because I don't fit the mold of your expectations, you don't accept that. You want a Messiah after your image, when in fact what God is giving you is a Messiah cut from a very different mold. Now, if you were of my sheep, then you would recognize who I am because my works testify to my identity, and all of these things are irrefutable. But because your blinders are still on, you don't see it. My lesson for all of us is simply that. We are Christian people, and of course, we hope and pray and have good reason to believe that we are of his sheep. We are those who have eyes to see, ears to hear. And yet even we can have a misguided and somewhat distorted idea of what the Messiah really is. And many times we want the Messiah to be something more of what we want, you know, who will solve the problems that we see as the most conspicuous problems in our lives, to get rid of the Romans in our lives that are troubling us right at the moment. We want the Messiah to be a Messiah of our making, to do our bidding, and I'm sorry to tell you, Christ doesn't come to do our bidding. He is the Messiah, and we are here to do his bidding. And so the question we need to ask ourselves as we come to this one who we indeed affirm is the Messiah is, what would you have me do? And sometimes 
Christ will put us in tough situations, difficult, painful, hard situations, where we might like a messianic, you know, rescuer, and he may say, no, I've got better things for you, I'm going to leave you right there. And then the task we have is to, in faith and confidence, trust him to be the Messiah that he really is, rather than simply the Messiah of our own invention.